Seems like a long time ago, but it uh, wasn't all that long ago. I guess it was a month ago, pretty much. We were uh, together last, um, and uh, it's, it's going to be, uh, let's see, the end of, end of April. I've got something, and then uh, three weeks, May, June. Uh, yeah, it's going to be a busy, busy, busy year. So that's why, even though I am uh, uh, speaking this morning and this evening, I'm doing Sunday school as well, so we can somehow make some progress in the, uh, in the church history series uh, before we make too much more church history to be able to even catch up, uh, basically, <laughs> at the speed at which we are, at which we are going. Uh, though it will be interesting to see uh, how the future, um, if the Lord tarries, uh, writes the history of today. Um, it will be, it will be an, an intriguing uh, chapter in a book someday, I would imagine. But we are not anywhere near today in what we are covering. You may recall the last time we were together, we were looking at the nature of God, uh, and we actually sort of weren't doing necessarily a, so much history as looking at the fundamental truths. I, I drew a uh, triangle on the board. I hope you all uh, jotted that down, uh, where you have the foundational doctrines that are given to us in Scripture, uh, specifically at the bottom, mo bottom, monotheism, and then the other two legs are made up of the existence of three divine persons and the equality of those persons. Uh, when you then deny one of those sides of the triangle, the other two point to the resultant error uh, that comes. And I emphasized at that time, uh, it is important, I think, to think along these lines because the fact that when you enter into a conversation with someone who uh, is in error on the subject of the biblical teaching on the nature of God, it is very helpful to be able to identify uh, where it is specifically, biblically, their error lies. And unless you think of the doctrine of God in a biblical fashion, the constituent biblical doctrines that make that up, uh, you're not going to be in a position to be able to readily identify where you need to go with that person in providing uh, insight to them. They, they may have never heard the truth. You have to recognize it, it's, you know, I'm, I'm facing this situation right now. Um, at the end of this month, um, literally like in about, I don't know, three, four weeks, I'll be flying up to Rapid City, South Dakota. And I've never been there before. This will be the uh, first time to Rapid City. Now, why would I go to Rapid City? I was just uh, teaching in Pachestrum, Johannesburg, in London. And uh, in May, we'll be teaching in uh, Wittenberg uh, at the uh, Shepherds Conference. And if you think about this, when the Shepherds Conference is in Germany, you know what that makes it, the German Shepherds Conference. Um, and uh, <laughs> So every time we've talked about that over the past couple of years, the German Shepherds Conference, uh, which is very different from the liberal Labrador Conference. But anyway, that's another, that's another place. <laughs> Thank you for laughing, Sean. I appreciate that. No one else dared to, but you did. And that's why I like you. <laughs> Both of my, my, my wife is not even, not, not even smiling, not even grinning. Just, just it, it looks like that a look of shame. Like I, I'm just, I can't believe that he did that. But yes, anyway. But uh, anyways, be in Wittenberg, and then um, a couple hour, uh, hour and a half north of Prague in the Czech Republic, and uh, then in uh, Kiev again. So what in the world am I doing in uh, Rapid City, uh, South Dakota? I thought it was in Iowa, anyways. So I, it's it's up in that part uh, where there's not that many people. And uh, the reason uh, is we're going to be doing a debate. I can guarantee you it will not be a boring debate. Um, if this debate were taking place in the Philippines, this religious group is the third largest religious group in the Philippines right now, um, I'd be trying to raise funds to take Josh with me. Uh, and even he'd be in a bit of a, uh, a tough spot because um, uh, this group tends to, to be rather aggressive. Uh, it's called Iglesia Nacristo, uh, the Church of Christ, but um, it's not the historic, you know, or the Campbellite Church of Christ. It's an anti-Trinitarian group, and um, in some of the debates they have in the Philippines, uh, the people they debate get beat up. Um, 
and even outside the Philippines, it's, it's real obvious to me in listening to the debates I've listened to uh, that there is sort of a cultic mindset that they sort of follow. And I'm going to try to close that down as much as possible with the rules of the debate uh, itself, but we will see whether they will follow those rules of debate. And uh, we've been told that they're, the place only seats 300 and they're bringing 300. So it could be an interesting experience. But uh, I, I would identify Iglesia and Cristo as bad Jehovah's Witnesses uh, in the sense of their argumentation. And so uh, their, their arguments are rather surface level. They're, they're very similar to what you'd get from uh, Muslims who don't really know the doctrine. There's a lot of misrepresentation, uh, you know, a lot of focus on John 17, 3, or, or something along those lines. Uh, well, Jesus said the Father is the only true God, and you know, just ignoring the rest of the testimony of Scripture, things like that. But it's, I, I have to remember, even in the midst of listening to this, folks, uh, what they'll do is they'll, the, you know, the, their speaker will cry out, but there's only one true God, and they all, oh, as if that was actually uh, part of the debate. It's not. Both sides believe there's only one true God. The issue isn't about that at all. Um, and it's, it's easy in a situation like that to slip in the mindset that all these people are knowledgeable, willful rebels against the truth. Some of them are. Some of them are. But I don't know who they are. Some of them never heard anything else. If you were raised within a group like that, that's all you'd ever heard. If you had never uh, heard the truth, um, you have to keep that in mind. And so when speaking to someone, and if you want to bring correction, if you want to be used as an instrument of, of leading them to a, a knowledge of, of the truth, then from my perspective, the most effective way to do that um, is to bring them to the Word of God. And unfortunately, a lot of Christians, what they tend to do is, say, well, you know, the Council of Nicaea said, and the Nicene Creed says, and, and so on and so forth. Well, the vast majority of them have already been taught to have a, a fundamental um, distrust of anything creedal in that sense. Um, and the reality is, the, the doctrine of the Trinity is a revelational doctrine. I know there are many people today believe it's just something that came later in church history, and you'll find many, many people in the academy uh, teaching that it's a later development, et cetera, et cetera. But as Christians, we believe this is a doctrine of revelation, and therefore, uh, to bring people to that revelation, to let the Word of God to sp speak to them, I think is the most effective way of communicating these truths, whether it's the doctrine of the Trinity. I've certainly found that to be the case in presenting uh, people with the doctrines of grace. You go to the scriptures. Uh, it's not your clever arguments. Uh, it's, it's not your ability to uh, produce gotcha moments. Uh, I think it's, it's bringing the word of God to bear. And so if you remember those three foundational doctrines, then you will be able, upon talking with someone, to uh, take them back to what those fundamental issues are and go right into the scriptures. Now that assumes uh, that we know where the scriptures teach those foundational doctrines. And this is a church history class, and so I'm not going to um, spend the time uh, that I have in, in other contexts uh, going through the fundamental revelation of monotheism, for example. But it really should be something that, as students of scripture, we are aware of. Uh, that we know about, that we can uh, present to people. And so, as I mentioned last time, I would uh, highly recommend your reviewing, uh, for example, the trial of the false gods in Isaiah 40 through 48. Uh, it was interesting, um, when I was uh, teaching out at Pachastrum um, a couple weeks ago, uh, Pachastrum is about 60 miles outside of Johannesburg, and uh, uh, I happened to mention in the lectures before that uh, that I think it was a Thursday night we were having a get-together at a, at a Ratio Christi meeting, which is a uh, campus ministry, apologetics campus ministry, Christian philosophy campus ministry type thing uh, that's worldwide. Certainly it's here in the United States, and they have, their, have it there at Potch. And um, for some reason they asked me to address the subject of Mormonism. I know a little something about Mormonism, so... Uh, I said to him, I said, by the way, um, 
make sure to contact the uh, local Mormon uh, mission and let them know that we're going to be talking about Mormonism. They'll send missionaries. And they're like, they will? So, oh, yeah. Yeah, you bet. They'll send, they'll send they'll, not, not to debate, but they'll send missionaries to, to check out what's being said and, and to show the nice side of Mormonism if we're demonizing them or something like that. But for us, it's, hey, it's a great opportunity to witness the missionaries. So um, they sent four missionaries. And uh, so I did my whole presentation on Mormonism. But it was interesting how it changed a little bit. Uh, it, it was different than it would have been if they had not been there because I had Mormons listening. And so I wanted them to hear an accurate presentation of what they believed. And then we talked about uh, what the Bible actually says about each one of these, uh, these beliefs. And um, so when we were talking about the Mormon doctrine of God, which is the primary focus that we had, uh, it was like, well, now we know that the Bible says, and then I went to the trial of the false gods in Isaiah 43.10, before me there is no God formed, there should be none after me. Isaiah 44.24, Jehovah uh, says that, that he alone stretches, stretch, stretch abroad the heaven, found the earth by himself. Any Mormon who is an elder, who's gone through the temple, has seen pictorially, either by actors if they went through the Salt Lake Temple, uh, or on video if they went through any other temples in the world, and there are many of them now, has seen it presented uh, that Elohim, who's God the Father, sent Jehovah in company with Michael down to organize the earth. But Isaiah 44, 24, Jehovah does this alone. So there's a complete con contradiction uh, between uh, these, these presentations. And so um, the trial of the false gods, Isaiah 40 through 48, uh, Jeremiah chapter 10. Uh, I, I do want to just, just, I want to show you something because I, I, this has always excited me. Um, but if you, could, if, you, if you could turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 10 for just a moment. I think you'll find this to be rather interesting. Um, uh, did he, did he, did he, did he, Jeremiah chapter 10. Now notice, uh, well, let's, uh, well, let's, let's go, out, let's, well, let's start at verse 1. Uh, I wasn't going to do this, but I, I think this is relevant. Hear the word which Yahweh speaks to you, O house of Israel. And again, I'm, I'm, I know we have visitors. Just um, I always emphasize this because I think it's one of the little tools that every Christian needs to have and be aware of that many evangelicals are not. When you see L-O-R-D in all caps, uh, that is the Hebrew tetragrammaton, yod Hey wow Hey Yahweh, which we slaughter in English as Jehovah. Um, and so uh, I'm simply rendering it in it. You, you don't say that to a Jewish person. Uh, they are very uh, offended if you use the divine name, but that is a tradition that developed well after the New Testament, so it's really not binding upon Christians. Uh, but it is important to recognize God's covenant name, um, and uh, it'll be especially important in dealing with Mormons who believe Jehovah is a separate God from Elohim, which is normally translated as God. Um, 535 times in the Old Testament, it's Jehovah Elohim, Yahweh Elohim. So. The Old Testament writers had no concept of this, but Joseph Smith had no concept of the Old Testament either, so that's sort of why that happens. But that's why I render it that way. The word which Yahweh speaks to you, O house of Israel, thus says Yahweh, do not learn the way of the nations, and do not be terrified of the signs of the heavens, although the nations are terrified by them. For the customs of the peoples are delusion, because it is wood cut from the forest, the work of the hands of a craftsman with a cutting tool. They decorate it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails, with hammers, so that it will not totter. Like a scarecrow in a cucumber field are they, and they cannot speak. They must be carried because they cannot walk. Do not fear them, for they can do no harm, nor can they do any good. I, I, I love the absolute acidic sarcasm um, that God uses of the idols of the peoples. Uh, that are fashioned by man and then bowed down to and worship. There is none like you, O Yahweh. You are great in your name, and great is your name and might. Who would not fear you, O king of the nations? Indeed, it is your due. For among all the wise men of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is none like you. But they are altogether stupid and foolish. In their discipline of delusion, their idol is wood. Beaten silver is brought from Tarshish, and gold from Uphaz. The work of a craftsman of the hands of a goldsmith. Violet and purple are their clothing. They are all the work of skilled men. But Yahweh 
is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting king. At his wrath, the earth quakes, and the nations cannot endure his indignation. Now, again, we, I've emphasized this when we went through the law. This was a radical concept. This idea of monotheism. The people of the world had never developed a, a coherent concept of monotheism. You had the God of your nation. They had the God of their nation. And the gods fought with each other. And the gods came forth out of the, out of the primordial ooze and, and all the rest of this kind of stuff. So uh, this is a radical and, to many people, extremely offensive uh, concept uh, that your God is the only true God. Thus you shall say to them, the gods that did not make the heavens and the earth will perish from the earth and from under the heavens. Now, I'm not sure uh, how your uh, translations render this, but up until this point, at least New American Standard had everything in poetic form. And then verse 11 goes to prose form. And then verse 12 goes back into poetic form. It is he who made the earth by his power, who established the world by his wisdom, and by his understanding he has stretched out the heavens. When he utters his voice, there is too much, and so on and so forth. So it, it continues out. Why would verse 11 be taken out of poetic form and put into prose form? Well, what's fascinating here is there are two primary languages in which the Bible was written. Hebrew in the Old Testament and Greek in the New Testament. But there is a tertiary and third language, and it's called Aramaic. Now, Aramaic is very closely related to uh, Biblical Hebrew. It's a Semitic language, um, and it would be the language in which the people of Israel would be communicating with the Babylonians and the Semitic peoples around them. And so what's fascinating is you get to verse 11, and... Jeremiah switches from Hebrew to Aramaic. And so it says, Thus you shall say to them, and then in Aramaic, the gods that did not make the heavens and the earth will perish from the earth and from under the heavens. Then back into Hebrew. Now why in the world would that be? Well, here God is giving the very apologetic, the very um, mechanism of defense of monotheism that the people are to use in speaking to the Babylonians to them in the language the Babylonians would understand. The gods that did not make the heavens and the earth. The, the Babylonian gods came forth from the heavens and the earth. They were derivative from the creation around them. The gods that did not make the heavens and the earth will perish from the earth and from under the heavens. So if your God ain't big enough to, as to have made the heavens and the earth, your God's going to perish because your God isn't real. And in the very language they would understand, that's given to them. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, most people have not seen that before. There's, there's, I'm not sure if you have a note in any of your translations that, that mention that, but now you, now you know. And uh, I, I think what it illustrates to me anyway is, is the fact that uh, God does want to communicate to his people how they uh, can then communicate uh, to others and provide that information uh, to them. And so... Passages teaching that there is only one true God. I mean, I think most of us are aware of the fact that every uh, Jewish person each morning, and we talked about this at the beginning of the church history class, but I'll remind us once again, every Jewish person would get up in the morning and uh, according to, what's the collection of the Jewish traditions that was gathered uh, together around 250 years after the time of Christ? What's it called? Talmud is actually the, about 500 years later. That's the commentary on this book. Mishnah. The Mishnah is the first. So, um, so about 250 years after Christ, you find dead pens and throw them away. Uh, you have the, uh, the Mishnah. And then you get commentary on the Mishnah over the next number of hundreds of years called the Gemara. You put the two of them together, and that becomes what is known eventually as the Talmud. So we know uh, from the, uh, the Mishnah, this uh, collection of, uh, of traditions, 
most of which go back to the days of Jesus. You have to be careful. You can't just assume if it's in the Mishnah that it was necessary contemporaneous with Jesus, but it's an important source. That there are numerous rules already established at this time for how you are to say the defining Jewish prayer. What is the defining Jewish prayer? That's, that's the first two words. Uh, that's good. Uh, and the first word's the name. Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God, Yahweh is one. Again, don't say it to a Jewish person. Uh, they don't say that. They say, they say Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. They will change Yahweh to Adonai, which means my Lord. That's, a, again, a later, a later tradition. Uh, but there are all these rules. Uh, as to how you're to say this, so on and so forth. And it is definitional of the Jewish people to have that, that statement. And it, right there it says, Yahweh Echad, Yahweh is one. There is only one Yahweh. And the Trinity does not deny that. that I'm going to have to be pounding that um, April 21st. Uh, up in Rapid City because the assumption of the Iglesia de Cristo is that we are saying that there's more than one God. We are not saying that there is more than one God. There is only one God, Yahweh, but the fact the Bible identifies the Father, the Son, the Spirit as Yahweh is obviously directly relevant to the proof of the doctrine of the Trinity. Yes, sir? In the Hebrew language, is that one a numerical word or not? Echad. Mean, uh, him alone. Echad uh, can be a number. It can, it can be a numerical one, or it can be a composite one. It depends on how it's being used. So there is only one God, Yahweh. Uh, but that does not, and see, this is, again, and this is sort of might, might help me transition back to church history here eventually. Um, one of the things that I will be explaining to our friends up there is you have monotheism, and that means there is one being of God. But then you have Unitarianism. Now, the problem is that in, uh, in our modern period, there is a Unitarian Universalist church. And uh, those words end up taking on meanings that they didn't necessarily have historically. So the Unitarian Universalists, about the only way to describe their theology is woo-woo. <laughs> um, because there's no other substance to it. It's just woo-woo. It's, 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 um, you, you can't even get to the point of talking about, well, if you're a, uni if you're a Universalist, that means you believe everyone's going to be saved. Yeah, that's what you got in the shack, for example. Uh, everyone's going to be saved, universalism. But they've gone way beyond that into New Age woo-wooism. And so it's, it's, it's just way out there. But Unitarian has a historical technical meaning, which is how we're using it here. It's not a denomination. Um, these are not, this, this is not an equal sign. You have to say no. Uh, because we're monotheists, but we're Trinitarians. So what's, what, what are these things referring to? Monotheism is referring to the being of God. There is only one being of God. This is referring to persons. So Unitarianism would be one person. Trinitarianism, three persons. There are some people, if you read scholarly literature today, it would say that the... Uh, the New Testament originally was binitarian, two persons. I think they're wrong about that, but uh, you, again, if you're reading that type of thing, and so on and so forth. So uh, almost every group that you'll meet, especially if it's a cultic group, and Iglesia and Cristo is about as cultic as they come. Um, in, fa in fact, it was interesting when I was in Potch, um, there is a cult developing right now in South Africa. Brand new one. It's only four and a half, not, not yet five years old. And uh, a fellow PhD student of mine there at Potch um, and I were having lunch, and he's doing his dissertation on this group. And I'm like, 
dude, um, you realize that you're at the period of greatest doctrinal development in the history of most cults, which means you could write half your dissertation, and by the time you get half of it written, the whole group has changed theology. Uh, could, could be a bit of a challenge for you. And he didn't take that real well. But anyway, um, uh, well, I, I was just, I, I mentioned on the dividing line, there was a book written in 1834, 1835 uh, called Mormonism Unveiled by E.D. Howe. And it was the first Christian book written against Mormonism, and it was right at that early period. Well, Joseph Smith developed his wildest theology, what, uh, you know, about two or three years after that. So what E.D. Howe's book does is it sort of gives us an insight into what the earliest Mormonism was before all the wildest development took place. And um, so all of these, but all these groups, all of these, uh, these cultic groups um, will assume certain things without ever proving them. And when you're dealing with Muslims, I'm not including Muslims in the term cult, that would destroy the word cult. That's a, another world religion. Um, whether it's Muslims, Jehovah's Witnesses, the Way International, and all the fragmentary groups that have split off from that, Iglesia Nacristo, uh, this group down in South Africa called Christ in Me. Um, all these groups assume, but never prove, this. They assume Unitarianism. They just assume it. And they demand you assume it. And every interpretation of every verse they'll give you will assume Unitarianism. And the, and the, the reason um, that you will uh, experience tremendous uh, frustration in talking with these groups is because of this assumption. And that means you will constantly be having to challenge them on this very issue. I'm going to be doing it in a few weeks myself. Let me give you an example. Um, any place where Jesus uh, is distinguished from the Father, and the Father is called God, means Jesus isn't God, because you assume Unitarianism. So, uh, blessed be the God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, since God is Unitarian, and the Father is God, that means Jesus is what? Can't be God. Can't be deity. It doesn't matter if he's called Kurios. It doesn't matter if Kurios is used as for the name of Yahweh throughout the Old Testament. That's what it naturally would have communicated to the New Testament people. That doesn't matter. If you're assuming Unitarianism, then that's how you think. If in John 17, 3, Jesus says, uh, it prays to the Father and calls him the only true God, pff, there it is. Jesus isn't God. Now, of course, my, my immediate response would be, what do you expect him to call him? One of many gods? He was a monotheist. He believes in only one God. The issue is, one sentence later, when he talks about his being glorious in the presence of the Father uh, in eternity past, how do you deal with that? Uh, and they don't really have an answer uh, to, to that. So, anyway, this assumption of Unitarianism, Jehovah's Witnesses do it constantly, the, the Muslims do it constantly, and you have to say, look, before you can assume that, you have to ask the question, does Revelation itself give us an indication whether we're, all, we're monotheists, we leave the Mormons out at that point, we are monotheists, but are we to be Unitarian, Binitarian, Trinitarian? And the evidence then, and now we step back to those three foundational issues, the evidence shows us Trinitarian. You have three divine persons, they're distinguished from one another, That's, you want to go into John 14, John 16, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, clearly distinguished from one another, so you don't want to go with the oneness perspective. Remember, we talked about modalism last time. Um, but then you have to demonstrate the equality of, of the divine persons, which would be the te text on the deity of Christ, the identification of Jesus as Yahweh, things like that. Yes, sir? Uh, if one of these groups says something like, uh, how do you prove the nature, or, or the, the nature of salvation in the Old Testament, right? Because I guess these groups could argue that nobody thought that there was a trinity in the Old right. Testament. Right. Well, what did I, uh, maybe I, maybe I didn't say this last time, because you have to forgive me, but um, I landed in Joburg on Sunday, 
They had me teaching six out, lecturing six hours on Monday and Tuesday. Uh, so at, at times I, I forget where I've mentioned things, but um, where is the doctrine of the Trinity revealed? Is it? Let me show you. You want, you want to see the revelation of the doctrine of the Trinity? You guys say Genesis 1, 1, 1, 1. No, I'm surprised I haven't done this. This is, uh, that's the beginning of, of Matthew. And there's the, uh, there's the end of Malachi right there. See the gutter? That's what the doctrine of the Trinity is revealed. The intertestamental period? No. Mm. No. No, I, I guess I haven't covered this. Um, and shame on me for not having done so. I think it's very, very important. Some people disagree with me, but I think I can make a pretty strong argument here. Um, I am not for a second denying that there are not clear prophetic indications of the outlines of the doctrine of the Trinity in the Old Testament. I am not denying that for a second. When you look at Isaiah 9, 6, I don't think you can doubt that. Uh, when, you, when you follow the Emmanuel passages, Isaiah 6 through Isaiah 11, every single chapter has references that are clearly uh, cited by New Testament writers as being in reference to Jesus, etc., etc. So don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that there are not prophetic indications, but those prophetic indications uh, no more brought the Jews to a Trinitarian theology than the prophetic indications of the cross uh, made them uh, expect the Messiah to be a suffering Messiah. It's there, but without the light of the actual historical reality of who Christ was, that's not the conclusions that they had come to. The reason I say that the Trinity is revealed right there in the gutter between uh, Malachi and Matthew is there's 400 years between those two. Now, it's not the intertestamental period where it's revealed. The fundamental revela revelation of the doctrine of the Trinity is in the incarnation, ministry, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That's where the doctrine of the Trinity is revealed. Think about Peter. Peter was an experiential Trinitarian. Peter stood on the Mount of Transfiguration. He heard the Father speak. He had walked with the Son. He was now indwelt by the Holy Spirit. He was an experiential Trinitarian. The revelation takes place not in the New Testament. The New Testament is the record that comes after the revelation. And that's why the New Testament reads the way that it does. You see, if, the, if God intended to reveal the Trinity in the New Testament, you'd expect him to do it very differently than he did. When he wants to reveal he's one true God, you, he sort of belabors the point in the Old Testament. Okay? You know, over and over again, in the law, uh, I am the one true God. You should worship me. It, it's, it's very, very explicit. But that's not what you have in the New Testament. In the New Testament, isn't it odd that most of the strongest texts are said in passing? They're said in passing. I, I got to preach on Titus uh, 2, 11 through 15 at Antioch Bible Church in Randburg, uh, which is a suburb of Johannesburg. And I pointed out uh, in, that, in that sermon that in Titus chapter 2, verse 13, uh, Paul identifies Jesus as our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, wow, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, does not give a word of explanation. Doesn't say now. Let me stop and explain what this means. Let's talk about the hypostatic union and monotheism. He doesn't do any of that. He, he's he's actually exhorting them to live a righteous life. It's the grace of God has appeared to bring salvation to all men, teaching us to to reject ungodliness and and worldly lusts and to live godly and soberly, so on and so forth. Um, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who will redeem the people unto himself. And he gives all these Old Testament texts about Yahweh uh, redeeming the people unto himself. But he never explains any of the rest of it. Why, why is that? Because he doesn't need to. The revelation of these things was already the common possession of the Christian people. And so the vast majority of the texts that prove these things are simply said in passing. When, uh, it, Paul, can, Paul can use in Philippians 2, 5 through 11... The great Carmen Christi referring to the pre-existence of Christ and his humiliation and his exaltation and all the rest of this stuff. And it's a sermon illustration. It's not the central point of what he's saying. Why is that? 
Why are the Trinitarian passages, the, the love of God, the, uh, the, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all? It's just said in passing because it's already the common possession of the church. The revelation has already taken place in the incarnation of Jesus Christ, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The New Testament now is being written within the milieu of that revelation. It's not trying to to mediate that revelation or to explain something new it's never been heard of before, it's now expressing these things. And that's why the New Testament has the form that it does. And that's why I say the revelation takes place historically in the incarnation, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and that explains uh, the nature of the New Testament evidence itself in regards to the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, I didn't come up with that on my own. Uh, that's uh, primarily, if you, if you want to read, a, if you want to read the best stuff I've ever read on that subject, his name's B.B. Warfield, Benjamin Breckenridge Warfield, his studies on the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, extremely helpful, extremely helpful. Yes, sir. It's really simple, right? Now, the attributes of God must necessarily belong exclusively to him. Especially the most important attribute, attribute of God, that it is anarchos without beginning. Yes or no? Because there must be only one being in the universe that always existed and had no beginning. Now, if we can prove, I mean really, in the open prove from the New Testament, maybe from the Old Testament also, without being able, nobody to refute that, that Christ had no beginning. That would make him non-creature. As a divine person, yes. If he's a non-creature, and if he didn't, did not have a beginning, that would mean, ex I mean, wouldn't that mean that he was God? Well, yep. since there's only one thing in the universe that has no beginning. Yes, obviously, but uh, at that point, you have to be able to explain to people why there are texts that refer to Christ's birth. So, in other words, you have to be able to go to those texts. Christ says, I have come down out of heaven, uh, the pre-existence passages, uh, to be able to uh, differentiate between Christ, because the Word became flesh at a point in time. Jesus' physical body did not eternally exist. Uh, but the Son, the second person of the Trinity, did eternally exist, and that's why we go into John 1.1, 1, 1, uh, we talk about the fact that John uses one verbal form for all of creation, a different verbal form for the Logos, until verse 14, uh, where the word becomes flesh, where he uses uh, the same form uh, that refers to an origin in time, whereas before that he never refers to an origin in time. There are all sorts of places that you can, you can go and, and address that, but yes, I think that's, that's directly... Uh, directly relevant to the truth, yes. Okay, but I just want to make sure you understand what I'm, what I'm saying when I talk about how the doctrine of the Trinity is revealed. Uh, I, remember, I remember sitting in a Sunday school class at probably 19 years of age, 18, 19 years of age, at a very large Southern Baptist church, which a number of you are familiar with, um, and someone asked the question, well, why do we believe in the Trinity? And we were literally, in that Sunday school class, looking in the concordance for the word Trinity. <laughs> now, you may be going, ha, 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 and people around you going, you mean it's not there? Um, no, it's, it's not there. And uh, there's, there's a lot of questions that people have that have been addressed literally for millennia. Uh, but unfortunately, they're not the stuff of most Sunday morning Sunday school classes in, uh, in a, lot of, a lot of evangelical churches. But that's why we're covering it, uh, covering it here. And so, like I said, if you really want to, to, to read some excellent material on that, on that subject, B.B. Uh, Warfield, uh, one of the great Princeton uh, theologians, this was back when Princeton was a believing institution, um, which it uh, sadly no longer is, but... Um, uh, his work on the, the Trinity, fantastic stuff. Just uh, not easily read through, but you will notice if you read my book on the Trinity, I quote him. <laughs> uh, because he, uh, he does an excellent job, especially in the appropriateness of using non-biblical language to express biblical truths. 
uh, he does a very good job in, uh, in addressing that subject. So anyway, Unitarianism. Uh, <laughs> yes, sir? When you were listening to Jews, are they Unitarian? Or do they believe that the Messiah was going to be uh, was, was God? Do they believe that? Or do they... A uh, vast, vast majority of Jews are barely theists any longer, to be perfectly honest with you. If you're talking about the difference between a, a Jewish person by ethnicity and a Jewish person by uh, faith. By faith, if you're talking about an Orthodox Jew, uh, they are going to be very strongly Unitarian. Yahweh is, is, is Unitarian, is one. And so even though you can um, uh, provide especially intertestamental sources that indicated a plurality. There was an exaltation of the word of Yahweh and things like that in intertestamental sources. Um, but today, especially because of the reaction against Christianity down through the centuries, uh, they're going to be strongly Unitarian. Yeah, they're not, not expecting the Messiah to be. A uh, large number of Jews, well, obviously a, a Jewish person who's a believing Jewish person, and has engaged Christians before and has some knowledge of their approaches will be familiar with Isaiah 53 and Isaiah 9 and things like that. Uh, many, many are not. Uh, many are, are really not familiar with those texts uh, to any, any deep way at all. So with all that said, uh, when we come to um, the subject of the uh, New Testament, uh, I'm sorry, the t of the Council of Nicaea, New Testament. Thank you very much, uh, 325 AD. Um, there is a, there is development that has taken place up to the time of the Council of Nicaea. Now sometimes people get a little itchy when you talk about doctrinal development. How can something be a, a revelation if there is development in the understanding of it? Well, uh, let me point out, uh, I think, a very good counter uh, balance to this or counter example that, again, this might make you uncomfortable, but you need to realize the reality of church history. Um, it took over, th it took 300 years in church history before someone actually wrote an entire book on the atonement. 300 years. And it's not because everybody just, oh, we all, we all believe the same thing about the atonement. No. In fact, when Irenaeus at the end of the second century is fighting the Gnostics, he comes up with a recapitulation theory that is anything but biblical in its understanding of the doctrine of the atonement and the means of the atonement and ransom to Satan theories, and when, you, when we talk about uh, atonement theories in church history, it's depressing. So what is, does that mean that there had to have been a full understanding in the theology of the first two centuries, and anything past that is just, well, it can't be considered to be apostolic? Remember, many of those people didn't even have the entire New Testament. Many of them were running for their lives, just trying to survive, it doesn't give you a whole lot of time to be doing meaningful work on systematic theology. You know, it's, looking, it's like looking at the early Anabaptists. You know, few of them lived more than five, six years. It takes a while to put stuff together. And so, uh, yes, there is doctrinal development. Um, that doesn't mean that the church then becomes a source of theological revelation. It does not mean that the results of that development are either inspired or not inspired. The standard remains the only source of divine revelation we have, and that is that which is theonistos, that which is God-breathed, which is itself scripture. And so that will, again, lead us to consideration of the authority of councils. But we need, finally, to get into the Arian conflict of the Council of Nicaea, now that we've sort of laid a little foundation theologically in regards to some of the um, issues that led up to that period. And so next time, hopefully, we will dive into the actual, uh, uh, who laid the egg that led to the Arian controversy? I already told you. Anybody remember? Who laid the egg that eventually hatched into Arianism? Origin. How did Origin do it? Origin referred to God the Father as Ha Theos, and to the Son simply as Theos. 
He wasn't trying to lead the Aryan controversy, but he did. And uh, we'll see what came of, uh, of that next time around. Okay? All right, let's, uh, let's close the word of prayer. Father, once again, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this opportunity we've had to consider it and to consider your truth. We ask that you would make us sharper instruments in your hands to be used to your honor and glory. Uh, Lord, draw your people unto yourself. Be glorified this day, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.